China shoots to the top of the arms race? And is autism the next step in human evolution? Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, this is Jason Carpenter back for another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. Hope you're having a great day. It's the July 3rd, it's the day before the 4th of July. I think I'm going to do a couple episodes, uh, record a couple episodes today. I, I'm probably going to be out doing stuff tomorrow. I hope you guys are having fun too, whatever you decide to do, wherever you're at. Hope you guys have a good day tomorrow and today, not just tomorrow. Don't let that despair code get you down. The despair code in the last episode, it's funny because I know that I'm going to get some pushback on that episode because I kind of said this is what the despair code is. There's a lot of theories of what the despair code is, and that one seemed to be the most succinct. So if you've ever been curious about what the despair code probably actually is, again, it's a conspiracy theory, and it's most likely made up, but the idea that you make your own reality, and it can be a reality of despair, or it can be a reality of hope, and it really depends on on your worldview. And remember, you can always change your worldview. You can have some negative feelings and bring them around to something positive and the same thing you can be on the top of the world and you just like let life beat you down but but don't let that happen I'll always try to be on the positive side you know when i was talking about the despair code yesterday i was like oh you know the despair code. everyone's like don't research it don't research it it's totally awful and i'm like yeah yeah whatever i have had the worst diarrhea since i've done that episode the worst Okay, not the worst, but it's been pretty bad. I had left work early because my stomach was killing me. I was dodging. I was basically pulling the matrix with my butthole. I was barely making it in time to the bathroom. My pants were like Neil, like just sliding off in slow motion, bending backwards to avoid to avoid what was coming forth. Agent Smith is now my colon. It was bad. So maybe that's what the despair code actually is a reference to. It has nothing to do with being trapped in your own universe. It actually makes your gut feel despair. That's where you feel it all. All I ate today, I had a little coconut oil, which of course you're like, well, Jason, that's really bad. But I have coconut oil all the time. I've gotten used to it. I had some beef jerky and cheese sticks, and it was... I was reacting as if I had, like, stage four Spanish flu, you know, given to me by a swine in the middle of a Chinese chicken factory. It was bad. I held up a good front. I didn't let anyone at work see how distressed I was, but I think they picked up on it when every five minutes I just clutched my stomach and said, I gotta go to the bathroom. So maybe I didn't come off as cool as I thought I did. It was pretty gnarly, though. Now, I know you're thinking, what does this have to do with anything? And um, it doesn't really. Oh, it well, it does, because I think I should probably put a disclaimer at the beginning of that last episode may cause intense bowel discomfort because I, I, I uh, it may. Now, this episode will probably be edited quite a lot as I stop it. Run away. And then come back. You know what I think is weird? Is people don't like to use public restrooms. Now, I'm not saying I'm like a, a public restroom aficionado. But, actually, I am. I've actually thought about starting a website where I review public restrooms. Because I spend so much time in public restrooms. I go to the restroom, like, not all the time. But generally, if when I'm out at a restaurant, I use the restroom. I'll use the restrooms at... Grocery stores and gas stations, too. Gas stations are the worst, but we know they're the worst. But I've been in some good... I've been into some amazing restrooms. Like, you're like, this restroom is nicer than the house I grew up in. I've never been to a restroom where someone's given me a towel, like a steam towel. I always thought that would be interesting. And, of course, we've all been to those disgusting restrooms that, like, have no toilet seat. And you kind of have to, like, put your hand against the door. Otherwise, it'll open up. The worst are the bathrooms where the door opens out instead of in, because then I'm always afraid someone can just get in. I all like I'm always afraid someone's going to either. That actually happened once. So I was in the restroom at a McDonald's in Sacramento on Howe Avenue, and it was like seven in the morning. I used to go in. I had to work like at eight or nine, but I used to go into McDonald's buy a newspaper, get a couple cookies. 
drink some coffee, and use the restroom. And so one day I go into the restroom, and I'm, I'm actually reading the newspaper in the restroom at this point, and I hear someone enter the restroom, and then oh, the lights go out. And it's pitch black, because obviously there's no window. And I'm sitting there in the pitch black, and I know someone else is in the bathroom with me. And I just yell out, who did that? Like, I had to not say it as loud possible because I have this condenser mic. But I'm like, who did that? And I hear this voice. It sounds like a homeless person. They have a distinctive type. I think their vocal cords have evolved to be homeless. And he's like, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. And the whole time, I'm expecting someone to grab my ankles. Because the thing, the you know, how they have that huge gap between the floor and the bottom of the door. I imagined someone cut the light off and was going to crawl into the stall with me and grab my ankles. And I was ready to step on a dude's neck. Like, I had one leg up, and I was like, if I feel anything grab me, they're crippled for life. I will I will begin just smashing their skull in. And he goes, I, I don't know, man, I don't know. And I'm all, turn the lights on. I'm cussing a lot now, too. And the guy's like, I don't, I can't, I can't. And then the door opens, and now I'm getting light from the McDonald's. And he steps out. And then I sat in there, and I wiped obviously I don't think I washed my hands if I gotta be completely honest and I walked out and it was just a fuse something went out and the bathroom went pitch dark but oh dude that was terrifying but even then I mean I I don't have a problem now I know people who hate hate using public restrooms and they'll like oh they'll refuse to use them it's always like dude just just go to that no 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 no, I'm good and I did learn just for you know here's a conspiracy why do women always go to the bathroom in pairs this is really why i mean people go so we can talk blah 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 no it's because women don't sit on the toilet seat they squat and they can't hold their purse while they're squatting so their friends in there to hold their purse bam mystery solved dude just be honest if girls are just like oh yeah i hate sitting on toilet seats so i squat and i need someone to hold my purse just why don't you just be honest just be honest with us, ladies. It'll cause far less gossip about you. Nah, it will still gossip about you. Let's get started with the episode after I go to the bathroom. We got some good stories for you today. One of them actually came from a friend slash listener of mine that I've talked about before, Veronica. I was talking to her yesterday about the despair code, and during the conversation, she brought up an interesting topic. Uh, is she she believes that autism could be the next step in human evolution. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at that. But first, first, I got to address this story because it's the front page of Drudge. It's been big news for about two days. I wanted to talk about it last night. Didn't have a ton of time. China is ready to mass produce, quote unquote, laser guns. China's getting ready to mass produce these guns. I'm going to put the link in the show notes. You have to look at the pictures of these things. Now, what's amazing, you know, the problem they've always had with laser weapons in the past is the amount of cooling that is needed. We've had laser-based weapons on our on a like our huge cargo planes, and they every after each shot they would have to empty up the empty out the bay, and just all this water would have to flood out of it. They were constantly having to cool these big space guns down. They were basically basically used to shoot down missiles. China's China's claiming to have invented these laser rifles that weigh as much as an AK-47. It uses a lithium-ion battery, just like your cell phone does. It allows it to have 300 two-second-long shots and basically cooks you. It puts a it puts an invisible beam on you for two seconds. That burns your skin. It's this, this, the article describes the pain as being excruciating. And what's worse, if you're wearing anything flammable, it catches on fire. Now, you probably it's probably not like one beam and you're just like, oh, you're like totally like torched and you're like running through the street. But it'll probably burn the area around that enough to panic you. God knows what happens if they shoot you in the face with it. I mean, two seconds of a beam that's enough to set something on fire in your eyeball, you're not going to have a very good day. China said they're going to use these for anti-terrorist actions, and they do actually have a a pretty big terrorist population over there with the Uyghurs. 
it's not as bad as in other parts of the world, but it, you know, they they are running into that. It can also be one of the one of the examples they give is that it can be used in military action to set a fuel depot on fire. So these are these are pretty beefy. I guess right now, the production cost is about fifteen thousand dollars per rifle, which is far far exceeds what an AK forty seven is or another standard military rifle. But that's still incredibly cheap for technology like that. That you're not carrying the added weight of you know 300 rounds 300 rounds now you have a battery that can fire 300 shots and they said the whole thing weighs like six kilos they said it's close to the weight of an actual ak-47 so good on you china don't use them against us because that wouldn't be good but i'm sure here's one of those things if they're announcing these now i'm sure that other countries have had these for a while or been working on these for a while I think if you had something that was this much of a game changer, you wouldn't announce it in your newspaper. You'd use it a couple times in different actions, and maybe now they're announcing it because they're going to start mass producing them. And obviously people are like, hey, how come that dude is carrying around that awesome looking Starship Trooper rifle? And they're like, oh, no, 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 you know, like, don't pay attention to that. Now that they're mass produced, it's a, it's going to be a good thing. I think we're going to need them when we go to war with the aliens again. Aliens could be interdimensional or from our own planet, most likely not from space. But either way, we're going to blow them out of the blow them up. You know, nothing can defeat humanity. We are the reigning champions on this planet and in this solar system, and most likely the galaxy. So nothing can stop us. Nothing can stop us. They they could have all the laser ships and garbage and teleporters and whatever other sci-fi nerd stuff they want. They can't stop us. You know that. I know that. They'll know that soon enough. Now, you know, it's funny because science fiction plays such a big part in what we invent. Science fiction really dictates where science goes, I believe. The reason why people beam down on Star Trek, the reason normally everything before Star Trek, other than like obscure sci-fi, but generally in mainstream like flash gordon and stuff like that you would they were all shuttles like a ship would go here and flash gordon would get out of it and what happened was gene roddenberry wanted to do this television show but it would cost too much to make all these models of these runabouts that's the name of the shuttles on star trek i'm a huge star trek nerd by the way that's like i forget harry potter forget you know all of that other nonsense star trek is my nerd jam but anyway so they'd Instead of having those little runabouts and having shots of the ship landing each time and having to build like a life-size model of the runabout for them to keep coming out, move from set to set, Gene Roddenberry goes, ah, just have them teleport down there. That way we save tons of money each episode. We're just going to have people slowly dissolve and slowly appear. And that became such an iconic thing. It, you know, the, the, the term beam, you know, beam me up, Scotty, which actually was never in the show, but, you know, two to beam up and they go back and forth. Young people watching that, they are like, oh my god, that's so amazing. And they start to try to invent teleportation. They start trying to invent teleportation devices. Um, I think that, would we have been working on teleportation without Star Trek? Possibly, but I don't think it would be so in the consciousness to want to do it. The Taser, well, not a lot of people know this, the Taser is actually, there's a guy who invented the Taser. It's an acronym, for Tom A. Swift's electric rifle. Because back in the day, like in the turn of the century, there was a character named Tom Swift, and he was like a little like Huck Finn type dude, and he had an electric rifle, and he would shoot the bad guys, and it would stun them. And the guy who invented the Taser, that was his favorite series of books, so he wanted to invent a weapon that using electricity, electricity would stun people. That weapon has saved lives. The taser gives people the opportunity between, you know, going toe-to-toe with someone and blowing their head off. A taser gives you that middle ground. If that inventor had never read those books and was never inspired by those books, we wouldn't have that. Or we most likely wouldn't have that. You get that vision in your head. So I've always thought that was fascinating. How many people have tried inventing lightsabers? How many people have tried working on anti-gravity devices and things like that? So the, the, old, the old inventors, they would look at nature and say, how does a bird fly? I want to build something that flies like a bird. And the new inventors will look at pop culture and say, we can do this. 
I've, I think we can actually do this. What this fantastical idea is, I think we can do this, which I find fascinating. I think science fiction is important. As much as I poo-poo people for being nerds and stuff like that, and I will do that constantly, I, I think it's great. Now, this is a little, there's not much of a segue here, so I'm just going to roll right into it. So I was talking to Veronica the other day. Uh, she was saying that she feels like autism is an evolutionary step. It's the next stage in human evolution because they have more empathy and they're kinder and they have this connection with nature that um, neurotypical people don't have. That wasn't her term, but that is the term for n normal people. Is you know neurotypical people who don't have autism. And how they're, they can, she's telling me about how she knows people who can like communicate better with animals and how they're just this next, they could be this next step in human evolution. And she said, you know what the world would be like without people with autism? Like 70% of MIT graduates have autism and so on and so forth. Now, there's a couple of issues I have with that assessment. One, I think that you can have this, the, signs of autism and not be autistic just like you can have the signs of having the flu and not have the flu i could have diarrhea and vomiting and still not have the flu that doesn't mean i have the flu that just means i have some of the symptoms so if you get really obsessive over certain details and you're you're just like hyper focused on one particular field that is a sim that is like a sign of autism i don't believe 70 percent of the people at mit if they were tested would actually be diagnosed with autism or asperger's or anything like that that being said i took what she said she I was like okay this is interesting it's her theory actually um she's not alone there are other people who believe that autism that that's a possibility that autism is the next stage in human evolution. Now, what was interesting is the first, I found two articles. One was from 2007 from Discover Magazine. And they basically say that the, the, they basically say that same position that the, the someone who is autistic, they're basically evolving past our society because our society is basically become poisonous and only by turning inward can you actually, like, grow. Because our society has become so toxic over the centuries. To, to, to pull yourself out of it, to be in, inside of yourself more than a part of society is an evolutionary benefit. And those people who are hyper-focused and things like that will go on to succeed. I'm going to I'm going to come back to that article in a second. Because this article is how we're going to end it off. But I wanted to give you that that lead in because the article in discover magazine is, is fairly well written. The next one is basically a letter to an editor where a author, a woman, I believe not like that matters, but I truly believes that autism is the next step in human evolution. And, and this is it. What if those who fall anywhere, anywhere within the autism spectrum disorder, ASD are actually the next step in human evolution. In my opinion, anyone within the autism spectrum are gifted. Pure empaths, most certainly and probably, depending upon how high one is on the spectrum, gifted with other psychic or new age gifts. I think they were born feeling everything to such a high degree. Their emotions are akin to someone whose raw nerves are exposed because they do not have the protection layer skin provides. They find it difficult to exist in a busy, noisy, dysfunctional world where there is so little peace to be found. If you stand back and look, our society is hurtling towards something ugly. We interact less with each other on a personal level. We care less for our neighbor. We find it easier to hate, to destroy. We have no respect for others and dishonor the earth. It's like the world is speeding out of control and no one cares. So, so what if the chosen few within ASD are actually nature's solution? An attempt to save us all from the destruction society is speeding toward. Speeding toward. And so on and so forth. She continues to give everyone with autism a hand job. Now, here's the thing. That is the most hippy-dippy, highfalutin, ridiculous 
read on the situation. Anyone within anywhere in the autism spectrum disorder is gifted. They are the beauty of the world. They are true empaths. Now, that's just, that is just flat out false. It's a spectrum for a reason. Because on the one reason you have a, a, you have a person who is, again, hi, hyper-focused and working, tends to be withdrawn, has a hard time communicating with others, but successful in their given field. And then you have the person who can cannot take care of themselves at all, and unless you prepare their food in the exact right way, they will not eat. That's the spectrum. You can't lump them both in and say they're both in the greatest balance of the universe, that they're some sort of connected to the plant life and the, and the atoms that grow within the kidneys of the kumquat. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. If you want to pull, I mean, again, this is, she's basically making up her own version of the world, which I guess is fine. But the problem is, is it can be destructive because when you have the kid who has to wear a helmet because he's constantly punching himself in the face and biting anyone who comes near him, this woman walks up and goes, oh, parents, you need to learn how this child is the next stage in human evolution. You're just neurotypical. You don't understand. You're treating this child wrong. Now, the child has some problems that need to be addressed to keep him and other people safe. I can understand someone saying that, uh, you know, maybe somewhere in the spectrum, they have this, this sense to then claim, to then make the leap of logic to say that they are, then they're basically, we're, we are the, we're basically the homo sapiens and they're the homo superiors to take the terminology from the X-Men comic books. Because you, you think, oh, Jason, you're just blowing up. She's just, you know, she's just going on about this. We haven't even, this is how she ends it. Now, okay, go a couple hundred years into the future. Man is having to rebuild from scratch because everything was destroyed by the so-called normal people. Wouldn't it be interesting if those future people are able to look back on history and see that present-day ASDers Special gifts to society who were labeled, fi away, filed away, and dismissed were actually the leaders who could have saved planet, saved people and the planet if only the ego-ridden normals of the 21st century paused to consider the possibility. So again, now, anyone who doesn't have autism is just a horrible person, and the people with autism are like God's gift, they're nature's gift. I mean, this this is bordering on reverse eugenics. I, I she's all, I mean, it, the normal people, the the everything was destroyed by the so called normal people. Oh, when you hear me like doing weird inflections with this article, you'd be surprised how often she puts stuff in all caps and italicized a lot of stuff. I'm not just being a dick. I, I am generally a dick when it comes to stuff like this. Now again. You know, you guys know I have trouble when these conspiracy theorists ask, ask for money. That's what bugged me about that Lord of the Rings guy, too. I never got to that. That guy has a whole series that you have to pay for to watch him go on and on about how Lord of the Rings is based on true life. And people pay for it. He's making good money. I saw a bit of a video in it. He's dressed well. He obviously can buy a nice suit. This is just as dangerous, though, because, again, what you're telling people people and really you're telling parents of children who have autism and people with you can I can if someone has autism I'm not going to say hey dude you're broken because there are with there is there is a spectrum and some people are, are far more successful than me and some people have a hard time you know functioning within a family unit let alone society but for her to just say no they're all better than everyone else that is such a you, like right there, I can say, listen, there's a spectrum and there's these group of people, these group of people, and there's everyone in the middle. With her, it's all normal people are destroying the planet and everyone with autism are our only hope. That is, well, you know, now that I'm thinking about it, the author probably has autism. That hadn't dawned on me. But that being set aside, that's, that's a very hateful ideology. That's a very hateful ideology. And when you're preaching hate like this, really, how are you any different than someone carrying a tiki torch from through Charlottesville. That's what this is. 
That's what this is. You're claiming that everyone who doesn't have autism is going to destroy the planet and people with autism are the saviors. Now, we're going to go back to that original article because I think this sums it up perfectly. In the original article that I was talking about in Discover magazine, it said, I'm going to quote this here because this is, again, we'll go through the, the different ways these, are, these articles are constructed. Here's the quote from Discover magazine. And the going on the assumption that autism is an evolutionary trait. Here we go. Even if the assumptions are correct, her evolutionary hypothesis doesn't work. Mutations don't have a purpose. Natural selection works on individuals and not the whole species. The rise in autism, if it's even real, has happened in just the last 20 years. Unlike the evolutionary leaps the anthropologist cites, autism involves many genes and would take even more generations to spread if it was advantageous. And most of all, there's the sex. It's only an adaptation if it makes you have more kids, so a literal human connection is essential. And that is one of the key components of autism. You withdraw from other people. So... Short answer, no. It's not a step in human evolution. If anything, they will have, they're less likely to have kids. What is causing the rise in autism? We don't know. The, I've heard theories that it, it's not, and that's what that article kind of says, if it's even real. Autism hasn't increased. It's just what we define as autism has increased. There's the idea that it is a cultural, social thing with the way children are brought up, that it's environmental toxins, then you have ideas like the vaccines. And then, you know, you could have it that it's a, like a genetic quirk in the system. It could be a combination of two or more of those. So, I think I think we can kind of close the... I'll, I'll close the case on that conspiracy. I do not think that autism is the next step in human evolution. I do think it's weird to think that there is going to be a new, a new step in human evolution. But I, again, I think it'll be so small. The changes are going to be so small, we won't even see it. So, I think we're going to end this episode today. I got, I'm going to put all those article links below. DeadRabbit.com is where you can find our website. You can email me at DeadRabbitRadio. And, um, oh, at Jason Carpenter is our Twitter. So that is today's episode. I hope you guys had a great time listening to it. Let me know what you think. Shoot me an email. But more importantly, have a good day today. Have a good day tomorrow. We will, uh, we're going to post a net video. We're going to post the podcast tomorrow. And we're just going to keep going. And I'm having a lot of fun. I'm hoping you're having fun too. Thanks for joining the Rabbit League. And we'll be hopping into your life tomorrow. That's not really my outro. Trust me, that'll change. Have a great day, guys. Peace.